Hey everybody, welcome to week four of PS398. You may have recognized the sound that you just heard prior to this. Uh, did you? What was that? What was that? God, I, I'm turning more and more into a child show host every day. So these are my Yahtzee dice. <clears throat> I actually think the Yahtzee is a really cool, subtle game. Um, I don't play it all that often because of that. So you may be wondering to yourself, why is this guy rolling dice before today's lecture? It's a good question. You know, what do dice have to do with international relations? Also a fine question. And that's a question that's been on my mind too. And if you want to know where to direct that question, you should look no further than Theobal Theobald von Bethmann Holweg. I thought I was going to be able to get through it without stumbling. Theobald von Bethmann Holweg. Theobald von Bethmann Holweg. Theobald von Bethmann Holweg. And you're like, who is Theobald von Bethmann Holweg? German chancellor on the eve of World War I. This guy. Man. That is, that is some serious facial hair. That's a, that's a pretty good situation there. And you're like, what does Theobald von Bethmann Holweg have to do with dice? That's an excellent question too. You're full of excellent questions today. Well, the reason that I wanted to talk about Theobald von Bethmann Holweg is <laughs> that um, on the eve of World War I, when the final decisions were being made, as the final plans are being executed, Theobald von Bethmann Holweg said to his council, well, if the iron dice have to be rolled, may God help us. Dice. He mentioned dice. He specifically mentioned dice. Now, don't you think that it's a little bit strange that before somebody decided to get started with a war, war, war is, war stinks. War is not good. Nobody likes war. Nobody likes war. The people that start wars are under extreme stress. This is not something for 99.999% of leaders, this is not something that they're enthused about. Consequently, it is interesting that when somebody makes this awful decision to, to go to war, isn't it interesting that dice are what he mentioned? Dice. Dice. Not, not excellence, not... Uh, the importance of victory, not the spoils. I'm sure all this stuff got mentioned too, but it's the dice quote that, that made it into our psyche. It's the dice quote that's part of the fable of Theobald von Bethmann Holweg. Nailed it. Somebody call Nicole Byers. I think it's interesting that he mentioned dice because dice represent chance. 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 Probability. As in, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what's going to happen for sure. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know. That's kind of interesting when you think about it for a second, right? You start a war, you know that something bad is going to happen. People are going to die, right? There's no way to get through a war without, without casualties. There's no way not to expose your people to some amount of violence. That's just sort of baked into the enterprise. So if you're going to do that, why is chance on your mind? Why is probability on your mind? Why do you not know for sure? How do you not know for sure? And the answer, of course, is that nobody has ever started a war knowing with perfect probability that they were going to win it or that they were going to lose it for that matter. There's all sorts of important choices that somebody makes where they don't know for sure what's going to happen, right? And that isn't just in international relations. Somebody, somebody buys a stock, they don't know if it's going to go up or down for sure. They can feel very strongly about it. But that doesn't mean that they know for sure whether it's going to go up, down, or stay the same in terms of its stock price. Yet people buy stocks. There, there, there's billions of transactions. That might, that might be on a minute-by-minute minute basis anymore. People are making these purchases all the time. And they don't quite know. They don't quite know. When you think about it, they're putting, they're putting the money on the line. Retirement accounts. They're putting meaningful amounts of money into something that they don't know for sure what's going to happen. I mean, on a personal level, I mean, I don't want to compare buying stocks to, to, to war, but on a personal level, the decision to, to, to go a particular direction so that your nest egg or whatever is, is, is intact, that's a very important decision. That is a, as meaningful a decision as most citizens make. But this notion that, that war in particular is subject to probabilistic thinking um, is, an, is an ancient thought. And it was around the 1800s that people really started to realize that that one of the most important things about international violence, the decision to start international violence, was navigating all of the uncertainty, the uncertainty, probability, 
chance, uncertainty, things that you don't quite get to know. You don't get to know things for sure. I mean, even more glibly than Dice, uh, the, the great military theorist Karl von Clausewitz famously compared war to a game of poker. Now, poker is different from rolling dice. In poker, there's skill. But still, it's not drum tight. You can make the right choices while playing poker and still lose. Right? You can start a war that you thought that you were going to win and still lose. You can buy a stock that somebody told you for sure was going to go up and still lose. You don't get to know for sure. That's a, If you knew for sure, then it would be a lot more expensive. But you'll notice that everything we've talked about up to this point has been very certain. Right? I choose hawkish foreign policy attitudes. I choose dovish foreign policy attitudes. I choose owlish foreign policy attitudes. I, I know exactly. When I make a choice, I know exactly what it is. When I put tea into my Yeti, I opened up, I opened up the tea bag, little cover. I put the tea bag in. It said ginger tea. It promised me ginger tea. And when I put it in and I bring it to my lips, indeed it is ginger tea. And because I know for sure that when I'm going to go buy ginger tea, it's ginger tea. It's not very hard for me to think about my preferences over all sorts of different teas. But what if I didn't get to know for sure? What if like some batches were better than others, like, like you get with wine or something? What if I didn't quite know how good it was going to be? That would be very different, right? That, I would need a different theory of preference. I would need to think harder about what preferences are. Because when I'm choosing something where I don't quite know what it is, that's tricky. It's tricky. You have to think that through, right? You'd have to, you'd, you'd probably have to think that through a little bit. So my goal for today is to show you how to think that through a little bit and to discuss some of the ramifications that that thinking through has for international relations. Expected utility, which is what happens when we take utility theory and try to bring it over to the uncertainty world. This is one of the most important backbone tools in all of game theory. And moreover, it is actually more than just that. In international relations theory, expected utility is of important substantive interest, not just the technical tool, but there are in fact entire theories of international relations, in particular on the conflict side. There are entire theories of international relations that are oriented around expected utility, to the point that some are even named the expected utility theory. This is actually going to be our primary conception about what it is for a state to be rational when we think about international conflict. And so actually we're going to be adding some further assumptions. I won't discuss them at length. We'll be adding some further assumptions to the model. We're actually going to make deeper assumptions than just completeness, reflexiveness, and transitivity. And you're like, what gives? You promised me it was just completeness, reflexiveness, and transitivity. Sometimes it will be, and sometimes we'll have to ask more whenever we want to use the expected utility machine. What's nice is for as fancy as expected utility sounds, um, I don't know if it sounds fancy. It sounds fancy to me. But as, for as fancy as it sounds, it actually is a relatively straightforward thing to do. Actually, what's, what's really important, what happened in the 1940s when this was first starting to get developed, what happened was there were questions about when do we get to use the simplest possible machine. Expected utility is so intuitive. It's so intuitive. And you're like, we'll see about that. Actually, you, you'll see. It's pretty intuitive. It's so intuitive that it was, it was important to pin down when you would be allowed to use it as a utility function. All right, so we're going to use a utility function of a very particular form. And that utility function of a very particular form is going to be very easy to use. And that's going to simplify. Everything that we do is going to be based on expected utility for the most part from here on out. And so it's important for us to know exactly why we get to press that magic button called expected utility and end up with this tool. How do we know that we're on good footing when we do that? That's why we're talking about it today. Once we pin down what expected utility is, then we'll be done talking about what rationality is and we'll be ready to talk about how actors interact with one another. But we have one final little coda here, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about that, but this is important, and I think that you'll see that there's some really interesting substantive things happening as we go too. So I'm really looking forward to showing this to you. In the A block, we will talk about what a lottery is. We will formalize the conception of a lottery. You've seen lotteries before and you're like, yes, I watch the news and whenever the news are on, that means that some lottery advertisement's gonna come on. I mean lotteries in a more general sense. I know that's hard to believe. Um, so by lottery, I mean something in particular. It's a particular kind of mathematical object. Not hard, not hard, don't worry. So I wanna talk about what a lottery is and sort of how you can play around with the idea of a lottery, all the different moving parts and how you can use them for all sorts of different things. Then over in the B block, I wanna talk about what it would be to have a preference over lotteries. So if you go to a mini mart and you have to choose between Coke, Pepsi and Sprite where you know for sure what you're going to get, 
it's not very hard for us to think about completeness, reflectiveness, and transitivity in terms of how you view those elements. But if you go to the counter and look at the different lottery tickets that you could buy at the Mini Mart, now we have to think a little bit more. We have to talk about what it is for you to have preferences over the different kind of lotteries that they have at the Mini Mart, the different kind of scratch tickets that they have at the Mini Mart, right? What would it be for you to have consistent preferences over those? We're going to augment the theory a little bit and you'll see that in the end of the B block, we'll have this wonderful device called the expected utility function. And that's going to allow us to turn lotteries into happiness numbers, just the same way as we were doing with sure thing alternatives. Um, but along the way, there'll be some really interesting substantive vistas to enjoy it too. And then the C block, I kind of want to give you a sense about what this looks like in practice. And so I thought it'd be fun to think a little bit harder about territory and fighting over territory. Uh, so we'll go back to flat flatland and I'll show you just a couple of different ways you can think about using expected utility to, to model conflict over some fixed piece of territory. So hopefully this, you know, you're starting to get a little bit of the pacing. You're starting to get a sense about what to expect. My hope is that this feels like a very natural step after week two and week three. And so it might be a little bit of a breather, fingers crossed. Uh, but if nothing else, it it should be enough review of the old stuff plus a little bit of new stuff that I hope that you can start to see some of the really fun things that lie ahead of us. And you're like, why don't you just get to the fun things? I think that we have already. Let's get started. So here in the A block, I want to talk about what a lottery is. What is a lottery? The, the lottery is actually going to be a basic part of, of a lot of what we do. I'm never going to say lottery all that often, except for today where I'm going to say it ad nauseum. Um, but so lotteries are going to be so foundational that we don't talk about them all that often. And so I just want to make sure that we spent at least a block to talk about what they are and what they do for us. So the point of a lottery is that it encodes the idea that there's some set of outcomes that are possible. If I, if I choose something, it could well be that there are many possible outcomes. I'm, I'm not trying to be cryptic. I'll show you an example here in a second. But the idea with the lottery is not only do I know sort of the possible outcomes and the fact that I don't know for sure what's going to happen, but I also have some sense about how likely any given outcome is. Okay? So just to put a finer point on this, Suppose that I was thinking about the lottery associated with going to war, just like Theobald, Theobald von Bethmann Holweg. So if I'm thinking about going to war, let's keep things super simple. This is our introductory example lottery, super simple. Suppose that if you start a war, there are two possible outcomes. You could win or you could lose. Okay, this isn't so bad, right? So, so just win, lose. Two possible outcomes, win or lose. You don't get to know for sure when you start a war, if you're going to win or you're going to lose. In broad brushstrokes, look how broad these brushstrokes are. They're very broad brushstrokes. So that's the first half of a lottery, actually. The first half of a lottery is a precise statement, a priori, of what all of the possible outcomes are. In a monetary lottery, it's like, what are the possible amounts of money you could win or lose? In the war lottery, it's could you win or could you lose? If you're buying a stock, it's like all of the possible stock prices the stock could be in some amount of time that you care about. First things first, and this is actually just good advice in general. Whenever you make a tough decision, first things first, write out all of the possible outcomes. Just write them down and be honest with yourself. When you start a war, you could win or you could lose. Just be honest. The step, step, step zero is be honest with yourself. So this is the first component of my lottery. The second component is just a set of probabilities over these outcomes. So, so here's my set of outcomes and here's a set of probabilities over those outcomes. Now, let's just, as an introductory example, let's say that the chance that I win is 0.5. Let's say I have a 50-50 chance of winning. The probability that I win is 0.5. Therefore, the probability that I lose is also 0.5 because what are probabilities? It, probability is just a, a set of numbers where every number is non-negative. You're not allowed to have a negative probability of something. And where every, all the numbers add to one. If I know that I have a 50% chance of winning a war and there's two possible outcomes, then I'm gonna, I've got a one minus that probability chance of losing the war. Just to show you, if my chance of winning the war is 0.6, if my probability of winning the war is 0.6, then my probability of losing is 0.4. I need two non-negative numbers and they need to add to one. That's what a probability is. So I end up with what you call a vector. I have a vector of probabilities one for every element in my set of possible outcomes. 
And so here in a binary lottery where there's two possible outcomes, I need two probabilities. I need one probability for every possible outcome. There are many times where I want to think about the probability of winning as a variable because not every situation is the same, right? So if the United States and Canada started a war, the probability of victory for the United States in, in that case is different than the probability of victory would be if the United States and the Vatican City started a war, right? For any two countries, there is a particular probability that one will defeat the other in war. I don't know for sure. I mean, not all wars are the same. Not all dyads, not all pairs of countries are the same. And so sometimes they need there to be a variable. And so what I'm going to say is let's say that the probability of victory, let's say the probability of winning the war is just P. Let's call it P. Here's P. And so what, what's left over is 1 minus P. And so if I know that I'm going to win the war with probability P, that means I'm going to lose the war with probability 1 minus P. So, so that's what, the thing with probabilities is basically you have one for every possible outcome except for the last one, which is just one minus all the other probabilities because you know they have to sum to one. So just to show you another example, suppose now that there were three possible outcomes in a war lottery. Maybe I could win, I could stalemate, or I could lose. I hesitate to call that a tie. Ties are something that happen where like you're, you're semi-okay with it. A stalemate is something where a lot of people died and you still don't know what happened. Now I've got three possible outcomes, win, stalemate, or lose. Now I need three probabilities. I need three numbers that are all non-negative. Each one is zero or greater, greater than or equal to zero, and they add to one. So let's say that let's say that you're super strong and I'm super weak. That's probably a pretty fair idea. So let's say that actually my probability of winning in, in an example is zero. I have a zero percent chance of winning the war. My probability of winning is zero. It's allowed. Nobody ever said that you had to have, no, nobody ever said that you couldn't have zeros in your lottery. And you're like, oh, I thought somebody said that. I'm very outraged right now. So maybe I have a 0% chance of winning. I've got a 0.6% chance of stalemate. And maybe you have a 0.4% chance of winning, which means I have a 0.4% chance, 0.4 probability of losing. So, so 0.4. Look, 0 0.6, 0.4. That's three numbers that add to one. And they're all non-negative. Maybe instead it was a third, a third, a third, sort of like a uniform lottery. Maybe I knew for sure that there was going to be a stalemate, so it was zero, one, zero. That's allowed too. That's what you would call a degenerate lottery, where it's actually not uncertain. So if the lottery is zero, one, zero, that's still a lottery because it's a bunch of non-negative numbers that add to one over some set of outcomes, but there isn't really any uncertainty. That's a for sure. If it's zero, one, zero, then you know it's stalemate for sure. But now, look, I can play with this a little bit. I can change this a little bit to like 0 0.98, 0 0.01, 0 0.01. And now that's a lottery that is close to, that's a lottery that is close to the zero, one, zero lottery, right? So uncertainty is actually sort of something that I can sort of play with in space. It's something that I can visualize in space. So those, that's what a lottery is in an introductory sense, is it's just a, a it's just two, two columns in an Excel spreadsheet. One column is the name of the outcomes. Another column is the, is the probability of, achi of, of achieving any outcome. One nice way to visualize a lottery is with an uncertainty tree. The reason I like uncertainty trees is they help us to visualize what's going on with more complicated lotteries. So just in an introductory sense again, let's say that I went back to my model where I had two possible outcomes, win the war or lose the war. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put... A little, a little tree like this, where the idea here is that at the beginning node, and then the idea here is there's a P percent chance that you win, and a 1 minus P percent chance that you lose, right? So it could be that you win, or it could be that you lose, and then I can just attach the probability to each of the relevant edges, right? So, so you make a choice. Here you are, you're making a choice, and then the iron dice get rolled, the Almighty makes the choices about what whether it's going to be heads or tails. Uncertainty is baked into the human experience. So something happens, and then you either win or lose with some probability. Right? And look, with this one tree, I can pin down all sorts of different... I can pin down every possible lottery over these two outcomes. I could have one and zero. I could have zero and one. 
I could have 50-50. I could have two-thirds, one-third, or one-third, two-thirds, or anything in between, right? So with this little tree, I've encapsulated all of the important information in this lottery, right? And this is a nice tool that's going to help us to visualize matters. So you can think about a lot of, you can think about lottery a lot of different ways. I know that it's tough when I tell you that you can see something many different ways. I know many of you don't like that sort of ambiguity. Um, and it, it's uncomfortable. And for that, I'm sorry. But I believe very strongly that it's important for you to see the same thing from many different angles so that you can actually begin to internalize what the thing actually is, right? A lottery, I could, ma I could write it just a notation. I could write it in a tree. I could write it in an Excel spreadsheet. I could, I could draw it in a picture. I could get a lottery a lot of different ways. And they're all the same thing. Okay. I'm just trying to help you. I don't, there, there's like 50 of you. I don't know which ones of you learn which ways. And importantly, some of you are good at learning many ways. And I think all of you are good at learning many ways. And some of you just might not know it. So, so just try to stay with me as I show you the same thing from many different angles. So let, let's go over to our, our win stalemate lose one. Well, now I need a three way. I need, I need, a, I need a three way tree where, you know, here's the decision maker and they could win, they could stalemate or they could lose. This is, this is pretty straightforward, right? And again, I could attach, I could attach the probabilities to each of the respective outcomes. Maybe it's zero, one, zero. Maybe it's 0 0.01, 0 0.98, 0 0.01. Maybe it's P win, P stalemate and one minus P win minus P stalemate. Whoa, right? So if I want to treat this as a variable with three outcomes, I need two probabilities. When it was two outcomes, I needed one probability. In general, you need n minus one probabilities because you know the last one is one minus. You know, you lose a, you lose a dimension. It's actually, a, it's a dimensionality thing. If you ask me questions about this, I'll tell, I'll tell you. So actually a lottery, is, is th these are called simple lotteries. And I hope that you'll agree with me that they're relatively straightforward. A simple lottery is a set of outcomes and a, a set of probabilities over those outcomes. And that's it. So what's nice about the trees is it helps us to visualize compound lotteries. So a compound lottery is what happens if I play a lottery and then depending on what happened, I play another lottery potentially, right? So suppose, for example, just to keep life super simple, that we were playing a game where it's like I'm going to toss a coin twice. And you win a lot of money if it's heads twice, and you lose a lot of money if it's tails twice, and you tie otherwise. So let's say that you you win ten bucks if it's heads heads, and you lose ten bucks if it's tails tails, and it's zero either uh, otherwise. Okay. So what I would do to visualize that is maybe I've got a tree, and this is the first toss of the coin. Oh, the drama! I toss the coin and it's heads. Oh boy! I hope I get another heads. Or I toss the coin and it's tails. Oh, geez, I hope I don't get another... T oh, the drama. We're going to cut to commercial. Somebody call Mark Burnett. This is going to be a great television show. So so there we go. So I toss the coin. And then depending on what happened, I, I toss the coin again. Right? So I've got a 50-50 lottery. And then I've got... I don't have the hands for that. So I've got a 50-50 lottery. And then I've got two 50-50 lotteries after that. Just imagine that I wasn't the world's worst weatherman and that I could actually gesture at the things the way that I want to be gesturing at the things. I got a lot of energy for you today. So just look at this. I've got I've got a 50-50 and then I've got two other 50-50s, right? This is a fair coin. We'll say it's a fair coin. Now tell me, what's the probability of heads heads? It's 0.5 times 0.5 which is 0.25. So if I toss a coin twice, you can take that 0.5 and multiply it by that second 0.5 and you end up with 0.25. Likewise, if it's heads and then it's tails, that's 0.5 times 0.5, that's 0.25. What if it's tails and then heads? Well, that's 0.5 and 0.5, that's 0.25 again. Finally, for tails, tails, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.25. Notice something with me. Now I've got four possible outcomes. Heads, 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 tails, tails, heads, tails, tails. And for each of those possible outcomes, I have a non-negative number. In this case, it's 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.25. Do you see that? That was first cut. That was pro-level 0.25. -ing. 
Pro Level 0.25 and is not a good band name. I know you're tempted, but it's not. You might be able to tweak it, but if you can't, it's probably not going to be better than a ska band. So I just made another lottery. This is a lottery too. This is a lottery over these four possible outcomes, but it's what you would call a compound lottery. This lottery is actually identical to as if I had just drawn it one, two, three, four, coming out of one decision. There is a simple lottery over these outcomes that delivers the same thing. So actually a compound lottery is just a lottery. So, you know, no matter how complicated a lottery gets, no matter how many possible things happen, you could always just kind of reduce it back down. You can always just bring it back to a simple lottery, which is the tossing of a coin or something like that. It's a relatively straightforward proposition at that point in time. While we're here, I just want to talk about the set of all lotteries over some set of outcomes, just to, just to write it out. I just want to show you what that looks like. Let me just show you what it looks like with three. Let's say I have three outcomes. Let's say, again, it's, it's win, stalemate, and lose. So you might remember from that example, it could be like point, it could be one, zero, zero. It could be zero, one, zero. It could be zero, zero, one. It could be a third, a third, a third. It could be any set of non-negative numbers that add to one. Okay. Well, what's the set of all non-negative numbers that add to one over three set of over three outcomes? Let's just write that out. Right? So that set, that's a set. The set of all lotteries over these three outcomes, the set of all lotteries is just the set of all vectors of the form P1, P2, 1 minus P1 minus P2, such that every P is greater than or equal to zero and they sum to one. So you notice that this is a two-dimensional variable because I need two numbers, P1 and P2. So for three outcomes, I end up with two dimensions. Four outcomes, three dimensions. Five outcomes, four dimensions, and so on. Let's visualize it, though. I want to think about the set of all vectors, P1, P2, 1 minus P1 minus P2, where they're all non-negative and they all add to 1. So just for a second, and just, just humor me, let's think about this triangle. And this triangle, the idea with this triangle is at the top, this is, the, this is win. Down here at the bottom left, that's stalemate, and the bottom right is lose. Win, stalemate, lose. That's as much for me as it is for you. And let's say that at this top vertex of the triangle, I put one, zero, zero, right? So the idea here is that this point in the triangle, this point of this, it's called a, the fancy word is simplex. This point of the triangle, that's the, that's the outcome that is win for sure. That's, that's everybody's favorite. That's awesome. Win for sure. That's great. Down here at the bottom left vertex, we'll say that's zero, one, zero. You know, I'm using all three numbers, but really it's a two-dimensional thing where you just know the last one has to, has to bring it home to one. And then over here, this is going to be the zero, zero, one. This is lose for sure. So the, each of the points of the triangle is, is, is a degenerate lottery. It's a lottery where you know for sure that one outcome is going to happen. Okay? It's, a, it's all zeros plus a one. We call that a degenerate lottery. So boom, boom, boom. But I've got this whole triangle to play with. I have this whole triangle to play with. So let's think about this edge. Here's this edge of this triangle. So here's the win outcome. This is win for sure. And this is stalemate for sure. Think about everything along the edge. Well, everything along the edge, this is every possible lottery where you know you're not going to lose. Okay. So here's, here's win for sure. Here's stalemate for sure. Maybe here's win half the time and stalemate half the time. One half, one half, zero. That lives right here. This is three quarters, one quarter, zero. This is one quarter, three quarters, zero. Everywhere along this edge is a lottery where there's two possible outcomes, win and stalemate. Suddenly going to war. Who could ever go to war when you have this triangle of doom waiting for you, right? There's a reason that you have to say dramatic things on the eve of battle because it genuinely is an agonizing decision. Sending people off to win or stalemate for sure. The uncertainty structure is so massive. And the only people that really get to know about that are the people that have to make these awful choices. These are actually attempts to sympathize with the decision maker. This is my plea for understanding. What could it mean? What could it look like to make that awful decision? How can I understand that? We're not even to the provocative thought yet. Now let's think about this edge. This is another edge of the triangle. Here's, this is win for sure. This is lose for sure. And so everywhere along this edge of the triangle, 
this is where you know you're not going to stalemate. These, this is essentially, this is essentially the same exact lottery that we had over the two outcomes. Here's every possible lottery where you could win or you could lose. Here's 50-50. Here's you win half the time, you lose half the time. Here's you win three quarters, you lose one quarter. Here's you, you win one quarter and lose three quarters. But no matter what, you know that middle number is zero because this is the edge that's, that has no chance of stalemate. And finally, here at the bottom, this is where you know you're going to lose or stalemate for sure. So you want, you know, there's a zero to start. So maybe here's zero, one half, one half. Right, here's zero, one, zero. Here's zero, zero, one. Here's zero, three quarters, one quarters. Here's zero, th one quarter, three quarters. Right? So all of these edges, so the, so, the, the, so the corners are degenerate lotteries. You know for sure you're going to get one outcome. The edges are the binary possibilities where there are two possible outcomes and you're uncertain over them and you can figure out where you are and then inside the triangle, inside of the delicious interior of our triangle, these are the possibilities where all three possible alternatives, where all three possible outcomes get a strictly positive probability. This is one, like here's one third, one third, one third. So this is actually the set of all possible lotteries over win, lose, and stalemate. This is called a two simplex, which is just math talk for a triangle. But you can imagine the set of all lotteries like that. Now, if it was a binary lottery, if it was win or lose, it really would just be a line where it like there's P and there's one minus P. We'll talk about this a little bit more in the C block. But the set of all possible lotteries is just a triangle with one less dimension than there are number of alternatives. If Arrow's theorem didn't help you at the dinner parties, that's probably not going to help you either. But it's a nice thought. So these are lotteries. A lottery is nothing more than a set of outcomes, win-lose, win-lose stalemate. Win by a lot, win by a little, stalemate, lose by a little, lose by a lot. Every possible outcome between zero and one. Something like that. So you, you, you specify the set of possible outcomes, and you specify for every outcome some probability. We wind up with a set of all possible lotteries, which is just a simplex with one less dimension. Just a triangle of one less dimension. I know it's hard to imagine, but triangles, you can go as much as you want with triangles. You pause the video and think about that if you need to. And the idea is that the lottery captures what it is to have uncertainty. And notice that we're not giving anything up. So if I go back to my simplex, I'm allowed to have for sure outcomes. It could be, let's say I was, let's say I was just to make things very similar to how you've seen it before. Let's say it was hawked of an owl instead of win stale made and lose. They're still hawk for sure, there's still dove for sure. There's still owl for sure, right? Those three outcomes that we were choosing from before, they're still in our simplex. However, now we also allow for the possibility of you don't quite know what happens. You can make a choice and there's some chance it turns out hawkish, some chance it turns out owlish, and some chance it turns out dovish, right? So the idea is we took our theory, we've enriched it. We haven't taken away what we had before. What we were talking about before is just a special case. Now I've got the whole triangle to play with and not just the three corners. So our theory up to this point was just the three corners of our triangle, but it turns out there's a lot more to it than that. You, when you start a war, you don't get to know for sure you're going to go to a corner. So our theory has been enriched. We haven't taken anything away and we have added to it. Now we have added this really substantively important aspect of uncertainty. Now we have written down what it is to look uncertainty in the eye. But what is it to have preferences over that uncertainty? We're going to talk about that over in the B block. So here in the B block, I want to animate what it is to have expected utility. I want you to get a sense about what expected utility looks like and how we calculate it. So I want to introduce this idea by way of example. So consider a binary lottery, a lottery, lottery with two outcomes. And the two outcomes are you win $10 and you lose $10. Okay. And just to keep things super simple, let's suppose for now it's 50-50. So I'm going to toss a coin. And if it comes up heads, you win $10. And if it comes up tails, you lose $10. You could win $10 or lose $10. And let's say that I'm not forcing you to play with this. Let's say that you, you have to buy the chance to play this. All right? So my question to you is, how much would you pay? 
me for the chance to play this lottery. I feel like Monty Hall right now or Wayne Brady. So how much would you pay? There isn't a right answer. There isn't a right answer. You're probably thinking, oh, I got to. No, I'm just asking you what you would pay. For to, to win $10 or lose $10, would, would you pay? Would you pay a dollar to, to do that? Would you pay $2? Would you pay $3? Would you pay? Would you not do it? Would you pay $0? Would you pay me a dollar to not play it? Would you, would you, would you give me it? Would, would you, would you pay negative $1? How much would you pay to not have to do this? Right? So, so, okay. You're probably not going to pay $11 to play this lottery. Because right? if you paid eleven dollars to win a lottery where the best case scenario was ten bucks, I'd want to have a long talk with you. And you probably wouldn't pay more than ten dollars to not play it, right? Because the worst case scenario is you lose ten dollars. Why would you pay eleven dollars to not play this game? So what you would pay to play this game is less than ten dollars, probably. And what you would pay to not play this game if you really don't like risk is is. It's no lower than minus 10. It, you know, it's no lower than minus 10. So somewhere in between here is what this is worth to you. If it's worth a dollar, then what that means is you would give me a dollar for sure to play this lottery. If it's worth two dollars, what that means is you would give me a do- you would give me two dollars to play this lottery. You would exchange. Right? If I give you the option of two dollars for sure or this lottery, that's a binary comparison. I need a squiggly greater than or equal to sign for that, right? $2 for sure is a lottery and $10, 50, 50 minus $10 is a lottery. What is it to have preferences over these lotteries? I have to come up with a binary preference relation over these lotteries, right? Now, I don't want to have to tell you about all the possibilities. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how what the usual utility function is over this. And then we'll talk about what that means for the associated behavioral preferences, what are the additional assumptions I had to make to get to use this machine? I don't want to talk about the binary preference relation start. I want to start with the utility function and then show you what the utility function demands of us. So the way that I would figure out what this is worth to me is I would calculate the expected value. I would calculate the expected value. So what I would do is I would say, okay, $10. I have I have a 50% chance. I have a 0.5 probability of winning $10. So I'm going to multiply 0.5 times 10. And then I'm going to take the minus 10. I'm going to multiply that by the 0.5 chance that I have of losing $10. So I wind up with 0.5 times 10 times 0.5 times minus 10, which is zero. This lottery is essentially valueless to me because its expected value is $0. The expected value of this lottery is $0. This is how statisticians think. This is how probabilists think. The expected value is an important part of probability theory. So if you ask a statistician to evaluate a lottery, which is just a set of probabilities over some set of outcomes, they would calculate the expected value, right? And so in the units of the outcomes, which in this case is dollars, you get exactly what this is worth. The expected value of this lottery is $10, is $0. But what if I had changed the probabilities? What if you didn't know the probability for sure? What if you knew that you could win with probability P and lose with probability 1 minus P? Well, now the expected value of this lottery is P times $10, right? P times $10 times 1 minus P times minus $10. That works out to 20P minus $10. You're like, oh my God, what does that mean? Well, let's think about it. Suppose that P was 0.5 like it was before. Well, 20 times 0.5 is 10. 10 minus 10 is zero. That's what we had before. But now I have a more general way to think about this. So suppose that P was one. Suppose that I knew I was going to win for sure. Now it's 20 times one is 20. Minus 10 is 10. I knew I would get $10 for sure. Suppose instead I knew I was going to lose for sure. So that P was zero. And that made one minus P one. Well, then I would get 20 times zero is zero minus 10 is minus $10. But for any P in between these extremes, now I can figure out exactly what the expected value is. I can figure out what the expected value of this lottery is as a function of how likely I think it is that you're going to toss a heads. So the expected value actually is a nice way for me to compare two lotteries, right? So if you offered me $0 for sure, 
or or this lottery, well, if it's 50-50, I am indifferent. If it's 50-50, I'm indifferent between $0 for sure and a lottery where I could win $10 with, with probability 0.5 and lose pro $10 with probability 0.5. However, if it was 0.6 and 0.4, right? So if I have a 60% chance of winning and a 40% chance of losing, well, now, now I would rather play the lottery because the expected value of that, because the expected value of that lottery is $2, right? It would be um, 20 times 0.6, which is 12, minus 10 is $2. So, so long as the probability is more than 0.5, I'd rather play this lottery. If I'm using expected value as my utility function, here I'm saying there's a function out there that reads in lotteries and spits out expected values. And those expected values allow me to know which lottery I prefer and which one I don't. We're going to use this as a utility function. Okay. Now, remarkably, this doesn't have to be dollar values, right? So let's go back to our trusty example is we can start a war and you either win or lose. Now, it's going to be hard for me to compute expected values because I can't multiply 0.6 by win. Can you multiply 0.6 by win? Can you multiply 0.4 by lose? I can't. That's that's beyond my capabilities anyway. I need a way to convert win and lose to numbers. I need a way to take the because it was easy with 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 money, right? With money, it was like ten dollars. That's ten. Now, how do I multiply 0.6? But I can't. I need a number. I need a number that represents win. I need a number that represents lose. What is that? How do I take outcomes and turn them into numbers? What'd you say? No, oh, no, oh, speak up. Come on. No, I'm tired of this. If your, your participation grade requires that you speak up, you have to talk. I can't hear you in the back, please. A utility function, that's right. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna assign, let's say that winning is worth one happiness point. U of win equals one. And let's say U of lose equals zero. So now if I win, if I win the war, I get one happiness point, and if I lose, I get zero happiness points. Now I've got a lottery of these outcomes. What's my expected? It's not value anymore because it's not actually the value. Now it's the expected utility. I want to know if winning is worth one happiness point, one util, one utility number, and losing is worth zero happiness points, utility of zero. What is my expected utility? That's pretty cool, right? Because now I can just go, if it's 50-50, I can go 0.5 times 1 plus 0.5 times 0 is just 0.5. If it's 60-40, I can go 0.6 times 1 is 0.6 times 0.4 times 0 is 0. That's 0.6. The expected utility of fighting this war now boils down to just understanding what my utilities for the outcomes are and multiplying them by the respective probabilities. And then it's just as easy as figuring out how I feel about coin tossing. So expected utility is just a generalization about how you might have already evaluated lottery tickets. It's pretty cool when you think about it. So the fancy term for what I'm about to show you is it's the von Neumann and Morgenstern expected utility function. And this is named after John von Neumann and Oscar Morgenstern, who in 1944 published uh, the landmark book, uh, The Theory of Games and Economic Behavior, which was really, that was when game theory really came to the fore. Uh, Oscar Morgenstern was more than just a game theorist, uh, but, but he wasn't John von Neumann. John von Neumann was one of the great geniuses of the 20th century. This was sort of slumming it for him. Uh, he made contributions all through mathematics. He was one of those people that could master different parts of mathematics very easily. And so um, the theory of games and economic behavior is not the best thing that he ever did, and yet it is the, maybe the single most important book in game theory. As an aside, my dad learned some of this stuff when he was in grad school for operations research, and um, he forgot all of it because he's not really that great at math. No disrespect intended, dad. He forgot everything, but he remembered the names von Neumann and Morgenstern. And so when I was a kid, whenever he wanted to sound fancy, he'd be like, well, that sounds like a strategic problem, my son. And I'd be like, yeah. And he'd be like, you know what I know about strategic problems, my son? Apparently, this is my, my dad impression, which this isn't even close. You know, my son what it's like. And I'm like, no, dad, what's it like? He's like the von Neumann and Morgenstern theory of games and economic behavior, 1944. Yes, daddy. Can you tell me anything inside the book? Not really, son. No. The one thing I got right with that was volume. 
So the von Neumann and Morgenstern expect a utility representation. It goes like this. So suppose I have some set of alternatives, X, some set of outcomes. And suppose I have some set of probabilities over those outcomes. So suppose I have a lottery. A lottery is a set of outcomes and a set of probabilities over those outcomes. The von Neumann and Morgenstern expect a utility representation is just the a utility function that reads in the x's and spits out numbers and then just the sum of the probabilities times those expected utility numbers. So it really is just p times the utility of the outcome, p times the utility of the outcome, p times the utility of the outcome, and then add it together. If you, if you like viewing this as a spreadsheet, what that means is if I have a bunch of different outcomes, so here's all different, my different outcomes, and here's a probability for each outcome. So I start off with my two column lottery. I start off with a two column lottery. And I generate a third column that is the utility of every outcome. So maybe I assign every outcome a number, a happiness number, U of X. Then I make a fourth column where I multiply columns two and three. I take the probability of getting something and I take the utility of getting that thing and I come up with this fourth column and then I sum them up and that's it. Expected utility is just take the outcomes, assign every outcome a happiness number, multiply every happiness number by the respective probability, add them up. That's it, that's it. That's a, that's a multi-step procedure, but it's actually, this might be something that is very intuitive for you, right? So for his fan, you don't need John von Neumann to tell you how to do this. This is probably something that you've done before. You've probably done something like this before. This is a very intuitive way to proceed, right? And what's cool is this is a utility function. I can use this as a utility function. What do I mean by that? What I mean is if I have two lotteries, call them L1 and L2, and I have a binary preference relation on the set of all lotteries, I can use this utility function to represent my preferences over those lotteries, which is to say L1 is at least as good as L2 if and only if, here it comes, the von Neumann and Morgenstern expected utility of lottery one is greater than or equal to the von Neumann and Morgenstern expected utility of lottery two. This is representability. So the, an interesting question is, when can I use the expected utility function? When can I use this four columns in Excel spreadsheet? When can I make my life easy? Under what conditions does this happen? Under what conditions does my new utility function, this easy to use machine that takes all the complexity of a triangle or an eight dimensional triangle if there were nine possible alternatives and all these probabilities, oh my God, this is getting so complicated so quickly. How do I take all of the complication of a multi-dimensional triangle and associated happiness numbers over each of the vertices of the triangle? Oh my God, my head is going to explode. <laughs> Enter John von Neumann. Enter Oscar Morgenstern. And all I have to do is make four columns in an Excel spreadsheet. When do I get to do that? When does the von Neumann and Morgenstern easy to use zing, machine work? When can it represent my preferences? Is it just reflexiveness, completeness, and transitivity? No. So suppose I have a binary preference relation over the set of all lotteries on some outcome that I care about. Reflexiveness, completeness, and transitivity, those mean that I get to have a utility function, but they don't mean that I get to know what it is. They don't know that it's the super simple to use von Neumann and Morgenstern expect a utility machine. I don't get to know that. So under what conditions do I not only get to know that there exists a utility function, but there exists a particular kind of utility function, a von Neumann and Morgenstern expected utility function? And the answer is I need two further assumptions. I'm not going to spell these out in huge detail because they're a little bit wonky. If, you're, if you ask me in class or outside of class, I will talk to you about this. And you're like, what are we going to talk about in class if all you ever do is tell me you can talk about something outside of class? I hope that I, I hope I'm giving you enough content as we speak. Maybe. I don't know. I, I, I think I mentioned this before. I have this nagging. I wake up in the middle of the night. I sw this is not a joke. I wake up in the middle of the night twice a week concerned that I'm not giving you your money's worth. This is how it is. So I need two further assumptions. I need reflexiveness. I need for any lottery, the lottery is at least as good as itself. I need completeness for any two lotteries. At least one lottery is at least as good as the other. The other is at least as good as the first or both. And transitivity. If lottery one is at least as good as lottery two and lottery two is at least as good as lottery three, then I need lottery one to be at least as good as lottery three. So I have those. Those are familiar. 
going to add two more. Four, continuity. So here's a way to think about continuity that's in sort of broad brushstrokes. Again, these are just a little bit wonky. If I know that I like one lottery strictly more than a second lottery, if I know that I like L1 strictly more than L2, then there has to exist some other lottery close to L1, call it L3, that I also strictly prefer to L2. In other words, continuity just means that I can I can think about lotteries that are close by. There's a, there's a sense of close by with lotteries. So if I make assumptions, reflexiveness, completeness, transitivity, and continuity, then I know that there exists a utility function over the set of all lotteries, and I know that it's a continuous function, which means I could write it down without ever lifting my pencil. But I still don't get the von Neumann and Morgenstern expect a utility form. The straw stirring the drink is called the independence axiom. Much like in Arrow's theorem, it turns out that a lot of different important things depend on independence. Because what happens is, you kind of convert things down to a linear problem. And you're like, what does that mean? Uh, you can ask me sometime. So the independence axiom is actually the main additional postulate. The independence axiom is something that does not live up. People don't live up to it all the time. It isn't hard to take people to the lab and show them a bunch of different lotteries and get them to violate the independence axiom. This is really the thing that delivers the von Neumann and Morgenstern firm, form that we'll be using. Anyway, I'll stop talking about it so much and tell you what it is. If I know that I like one lottery, call it L1, at least as much as another lottery, call it L2. And then I take L1 and I mix it with some third lottery. Right? I do like a compound lottery over the two lotteries. And if I took that same mix and that same third lottery and I imposed it on the second lottery, which wasn't as good as the first lottery, it has to be the case that the mix of the first lottery and the third lottery is at least as good as the, as the mix of the second lottery and the third lottery. So if I take one lottery that I know I like as much as another lottery, and then I do the same mix on these two lotteries, that still has to be preserved. That's good. So basically, the idea is that my, my preference for lottery one over lottery two is independent of how I mixed it with some third lottery. That's the independence axiom. So that's our fifth rationality postulate for rationality over uncertainty. And if you do, if you make all five of those assumptions, that's an if and only if proposition with the von Neumann and Morgenstern expected utility, which is to say, if I can be a little bit more precise, let X be some out set of outcomes and consider the set of all lotteries over those outcomes. Suppose I have a binary preference relation over the set of all lotteries over those outcomes. Then I can represent that binary preference relation using a utility function of the von Neumann and Morgenstern expected utility form, if and only if it satisfies those five conditions. So in other words, the five axioms I just discussed, two of which rather briefly, these five axioms tell us exactly when we get to use it. There are problems with it, right? And I, I'll actually try to write in one of the problems of the, with independence on your problem set. It's going to be a little bit tricky, but I'll try. So, so the basic idea here is, I get to use not just a utility function, but a very easy utility function, a utility function that seems especially well suited to multiple possible outcomes with some uncertainty. I get to use what seems like the right tool for that job under somewhat stronger requirements, right? It isn't just vanilla rationality anymore. Now it's full on expected utility rationality, where the basic idea is that I, I don't just want any utility function. I want an easy to use utility function, right? Well, it, it stands to reason that the only way I would get to do that is if I added some more theoretical assumptions. That's the price of ease, right? You never just get to do something that's easy. You have to, you know, you have to make further assumptions in order to get to use that easy to use device. So expected utility maximization is the way that most international relations scholars think about rationality. So what I've talked with you up to this point is very philosophical and it's more deeply tied to real rational choice theory, decision theory, and so on. Once you get to applied political economy as it applies to international relations, which is to say strategic international relations, once you get there, people tend to use more structure. So, so, and just to animate that, I'm not making this up. So, so for example, here's a very well-known book. This was uh, Bueno de Mesquita, 1982. 82, 82, right? 82. Bueno de Mesquita, 81. I miss it every time. For some reason, I thought this book was written in 82. It was written in 81. So, so here's, let me, let me make sure I'm getting this. Right, so, so here's the part on the rationality assumption. Okay, this is, this is, this is like not too far into the book. This is like, we're talking about what it is to be rational. In this, this is one of the first books written using formal theory to talk about war. 
So what's the rationality assumption? The strong leader, as I have noted, cannot afford to ignore the interests and desires of those whose who support helps keep him in power. Yet neither is he an unthinking tool of their interests. The key leader must make sense of the competing, sometimes inconsistent demands placed on him so that he can formulate a policy that accords with his own interests. Boy, that sounds like Arrow's theorem, doesn't it? When he does so, I assume the leader is guided by a desire to maximize the net benefits he expects from his foreign policy choices. Net benefits he expects, not gets, expects. It's probabilistic now. The word expect doesn't, doesn't get involved if you know for sure. There's nothing to expect. If you open up a Coke, you don't expect to have a Coke. You just have a Coke, right? But if I buy a stock, I expect it to go up. A policymaker will never choose an action that is expected to produce less value or utility than some alternative policy. In other words, the leader is assumed to be a rational utilitarian interested in maximizing his own welfare. His welfare, in turn, is assumed to be intimately tied to the overall costs and benefits imposed on the society by his foreign policy. The key leader would not, therefore, start a war or continue to fight in a war if he perceived the net expected result to be less than that of remaining at peace or surrendering to the adversary. Of course, this does not mean that he must expect his nation will always win its wars. Rather, he must expect it to win, or at least not to lose, more than the leader believed would be lost without the war. In other words, the particular form of rationality I am postulating is that of expected utility maximization. The assumption is intended to convey the notion that choices between war and peace are made as if to maximize the strong leader's welfare and, by assumption, the welfare of those whose pleasure the leader remains in a position of leadership. Expected utility. Expected utility. By rationality, more often than not, we mean maximizing expected utility. But I hope that after three weeks of this, you're ready to not take a very blunt view. I hope that after three weeks of this, you realize that the von Neumann and Morgenstern expected utility form is itself just part of a broader theory, a broader fable about what it is to be consistent over some set of alternatives, be it certain alternatives like Coke, Pepsi, and Sprite, or uncertain alternatives like war. Regardless, what we're trying to do is pin down what appears to be happening to us. We don't know. There's no such thing as expected utility. This is all just a useful fiction. This is just a fable that we're writing down to try to convey what it would mean to make an awful decision like starting a war, to, to convey what it would mean to mumble to yourself about dice before you sent hundreds of thousands of your own people off to fight. This is all just a, an attempt to understand what that would look like because it's a nightmare to think about. And this particular tool, which we get to use if we make five assumptions, which I have now told you, this tool, for the, since this book has been written anyway, has been the main tool that this culture of storytellers has decided to use, is von Neumann and Morgenstern expect utility maximization. Okay. Now you know how to compute it, but hopefully you also know what it means. Really, ideally, you'd also have a sense about what it would be to play with this particular toy. Let me talk about that over in the C block. So here in the C block, I, I just want to... I just want to show you that much like with preferences over territory, there's a lot of different ways to think about war. There's a lot of different ways to think about fighting, even within this seemingly very disciplined way where you would think that there's only one way to do it. Actually, this is just a sandbox. There's all sorts of different awful sandcastles that we can build in the war sandbox. Now that's a good band name. So to animate this, let's say that I've got two countries, call them the United States and Canada. In case it ever comes up, I'm, I'm a dual citizen with Canada. So I have precisely no dogs in this fight. Not even Chewy, who is American. I'm just saying United States and Canada just to keep things animated, okay? So like we had in Flat Flatland, let's say that I've got a 0-1 interval. This is Washington, D.C., and this is Ottawa. And we're trying to figure out where we might want to draw the border. So suppose that the United States and Canada were going to fight a war. Let's think about the expected utility of war in this land. Where the idea here is that the set of outcomes, the set of possible outcomes, 
is going to be a, a set of different borders that might happen. So for example, it could be that the war went so well for Canada that the new border is at Washington, D.C. so that everything is Canada. Conversely, it could be that things go so well for the Americans that, that the new border is in Ottawa and everything, everything is America. It could be that the border, that the war goes like 50-50 and so the new border is exactly halfway in between. It could be one third, two thirds. It could be two thirds, one thirds or whatever, right? So maybe I've got a bunch of different possible outcomes, a bunch of different possible new borders to draw. So now this, what this is, it isn't ter I mean, it's territory, but it's like hypothetical territory where we're thinking through what are each of the different possibilities? What are the different possible things that could have happened? Right? What are the possible new borders that could be drawn after we fight? And let's say that each country goes into this with, a pro with the probability that any given outcome will happen. So let's say that it's pretty rare that we get full on, there is no America and pretty rare that there is no full on, there is no more Canada. Let's say that those are pretty rare and that most of the outcomes, I think that if you probably looked at the at the scores right now, that the United States would have a better chance of winning a, a war. So, so let's say that it ske skews a little bit this way. So that there are more probabilities over here than there are over, over here, right? Chances are good that if they fought the war, the, the new boundary would, would favor the United States. I need, in order for me to do von Neumann and Morgenstern expected utility, I need to assign each of these dots, I need to assign each of these possible borders a utility number. I need to give each of them a number. Well, let's just go with what we talked about two weeks ago. So the United States utility for each possible border is exactly where it is. So the United States, their utility for the border at one half is one half. Their utility for the border at three quarters is three quarters. Their utility for the border at one quarter is one quarter. Their utility for the border at zero is zero. Their utility for the border at one is one, right? So they get happier and happier as we go more and more this way. And Canada has diametrically opposed preferences. Let's say that their utility for each border is one minus X. So their utility for one is zero. Their utility for zero is one. Their utility for one half is one half. Their utility for one quarter is three quarters. Their utility for three quarters is one quarter and so on. So I've assigned little utility numbers for every possible border that could emerge after we fought. So I've got a bunch of probabilities and I've got a bunch of happiness numbers. This is everything I need for a von Neumann and Morgenstern expected utility, right? So, so if I was proceeding with this way, where it's like, oh, look at all these possible borders. Well, what I would do is I would, I just multiply every, every happiness number by its respective probability. Now I wind up with a bunch of, now this is my, that's that, that's that fourth column in the Excel spreadsheet, right? So now I have this fourth column in my Excel spreadsheet and I add them up and I get some expected utility. So let's just say that the United States expected utility for war worked out to 0.6. Let's say that all of these things worked out in such a way that when you added them together, you got 0.6. And Canada's, you could work out for yourself, would work out exactly the same, you get 0.4. So what I want to show you is that all of this complication was unnecessary. Because I could have found a P that I reduced this all back down to a binary lottery. So let's say that there's two possible outcomes, 0 and 1. Right, and the zero means Canada won, and they get to impose their favorite outcome. And one means America won, and they get to impose their favorite outcome. So I went from many, 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 many dots to two. And let's keep the utilities as they were. Let's say the United States gets one point over here and zero points over here and vice versa for Canada. Then I can find a probability of victory that works all this out, I can reduce this really complicated multi-dimensional lottery to a binary lottery where it's just win and lose. And if I assign probability of 0.6 for the United States winning and probability of 0.4 for Canada winning, then I get the exact same expected utility from a far simpler lottery. And this is actually the usual way of modeling. So in the bargaining model of war, which we'll be discussing at length throughout this class, the way that we usually proceed is to say that war is a costly lottery with two possible outcomes, win and lose, and the winner gets to impose their favorite outcome. At that point in time, it's just a binary lottery, P and one minus P. While we're here, let me show you how we would compare utility and expected utility. So another foundational part of the bargaining model of war is that war is costly. Um, it turns out that, that wars are awful. I don't mind telling you that. Wars are nasty. They're, the people die. Um, Fields are salted, infrastructure is ruined, 
and there's time that we didn't spend making video games because we were too busy making guns, right? There's all these awful things that happen in war. There's the destruction cost, there's all the human life, and then there's also just sort of the opportunity cost of not having created stuff. So the way that we proceed is we say that if we fight a war, if we choose to fight a war, we must pay some cost. So let's say that the United States, if they choose to fight, they must pay C sub U happiness points to do so. They pay a cost, they have a cost, and they pay that cost either way. So their expected utility of war, if they choose to fight, they pay that cost, right? Well, if they, with probability P, they win and they get one minus C sub U. And with probability one minus P, they lose and they get zero minus C sub U. You work all that out, and that means that the expected utility of war for the United States in this model is P minus C sub U. P minus C sub U. So if P is really high, if they think they're going to win, their expected utility is very high. If they think they're going to lose, their expected utility goes down. If their costs are very high, their expected utility goes down. This is all relatively intuitive. Similarly for Canada, well, with probability P, they lose and they get zero minus C sub C happiness points. And with probability one minus P, they win, and they get one minus C sub C happiness points. So now I work all that out, and then Canada's expected utility of war is one minus P minus C sub C. So now I've got P minus C U for the United States, and one minus P minus C sub C for Canada. Those are two expected utilities in this world that we're dealing with, okay? Now I can just put those right in the space. Right? Those, those, this, is, this is between zero and one. So P minus CU, unless the United States costs are very high, it falls in this range, and likewise for Canada. So I can just put those expected utilities here. Now an interesting question is, if I have all these possible deals, that could, if I could draw the border anywhere peacefully, if I could draw the border anywhere peacefully, or get to draw the border wherever I want it, but I have to fight for the chance to get that. Which peaceful borders do I prefer? Which for sure, no risk involved, peaceful borders do I prefer to the risky war lottery? The costly, risky war lottery. That's tricky, right? So let's remember the United States utility for each of these boundaries is X. So as X moves further and further toward one, the United States is happier and happier. That's how we micro-founded the whole thing. And likewise, for Canada, it's one minus X, okay? So a question is, for the United States, which X's, which boundaries that I could draw, which borders that I could draw generate utilities greater than or equal to the expected utility of war? Because those are the peaceful deals that they would prefer to fighting, right? So let's just try to visualize that. So here in this, here in this space, P is a number between zero and one. It's a probability. It could be 0.6, it could be 0.4, it could be 0.5, it could be 0.9, it could be one, it could be zero, it could be, but it's a probability. So it's greater than or equal to zero and it's less than or equal to one. So here's P and here's P minus CA. Okay. And every boundary that's closer to one, every border that I could draw that's closer to one than P minus CA is, the United States would rather take those deals than fight the war. Right? This is when they're happy. So here's P minus CA. The United States is peaceful anywhere to the right of it. And they'd rather fight anywhere to the left of it. Okay. Now let's think about Canada. Well, Canada's utility for a peaceful negotiated settlement X is one minus X. And their expected utility of war is one minus P minus C sub C. So under what conditions do they prefer peace to war? Which is to say, under which deals X is one minus X greater than or equal to one minus P minus C sub C. Now, the, now we're working this out. For those of you that have forgotten, whenever you multiply or divide by a negative number, you have to flip your inequality. You're gonna forget that many times, some of you, and it's okay, that doesn't make you stupid, it just means you forgot. Please go easy on yourself when you forget. We have to take points away but that doesn't mean we think that you're dumb. It doesn't mean we think that you forgot. And by we, I mean me and the grading staff. I don't just speak in the royal we anymore. That isn't true. I probably do. We probably do. 
Well, we work all this out. When is one minus X greater than or equal to one minus P minus C sub C? And well, what that gets us is it has to be the case that X is less than or equal to P plus C sub C. So that's over here too. So, so P plus C sub C, that's over here. And anywhere to the left of that, Canada wants peace. And anywhere to the right of it, Canada wants war. So now I've got utilities compared with expected utilities. And you'll notice that when I work all this out, there's a range of outcomes. There's a little range of outcomes. It goes from, from P minus C sub, the, sub U for the United States to P plus C sub C for Canada. Here's this range. It's, I got P in the middle and I've got P minus C sub the United States and P plus C sub Canada. This is called the bargaining range. This is the set of all possible borders that I could draw that both states prefer to war. So in this range, in this little range, which I know exists because P minus C sub U is strictly less than P, is strictly less than P plus C sub C. So I know there's a range here. And everywhere in here, peace is preferred to war. So what's great about the bargaining model of war is I write down this vanilla version of it with the P's and the C's. And what I learn is, in the absence of any further explanation, if the model was written down just as it is right now, war never happens. So in the bargaining model of war, the original, the default setting, before you, we add something to it, war never happens. What's cool about this in terms of like the scientific usefulness of it is you take a model where war doesn't happen. Then you make one and only one change to it and war happens sometimes. Now you know what caused it. We're going to be doing that throughout the class is taking this vanilla Mr. Potato Head doll of the bargaining model of war without anything else and then adding increasingly sophisticated apparatus to it in order to generate war sometimes and then saying, oh, that caused the war. Up, oh, that caused the war. Up, oh, that caused the war. That's how this goes. But it doesn't make any sense unless you start from somewhere where war never happens, which is itself paradoxical, because if you look out the window, sometimes wars happen. So you start from the puzzle. You say, hey, wars are costly. And because wars are costly, bargaining ranges exist. Because bargaining ranges exist, I wouldn't think wars should happen. But I look out the window and I see wars happen. Why do wars happen? Well, now, after we've jammed about how to get expect utility right, then we get the jam for the second steps. And that's going to be the rest of the class, at least on the war side. So in other words, expected utility, because it's such a simple tool, we don't have to think that hard. It allows us to take something as complicated as the iron dice and how you feel about your chances of winning the day before the, the war is going to start. You start from something that complicated. And next thing you know, you turn it into something simple through this machine called the von Neumann and Morgenstern expected utility machine. And it gives you enough flexibility that then you have a lot of fun. And, and, and we also precisely stated what the cost of doing so were. There were additional assumptions, but those are the usual assumptions. So... After four weeks, now we're, I'm pretty sure we're all the way up to speed. We are prepared for the enterprise. And more than that, there's a lot of promise in this enterprise. There's a lot to be learned, but there's also a lot of fun to have. So what do we talk about today? Well, we talked about iron dice and war traps and winning money and losing wars. And we, we covered all the bases today, right? We talked about what it is to be consistent when, when the outcomes aren't certain. How do we know what rationality looks like when we add this additional realistic tweak that for many things that are important in international relations and otherwise, you don't get to know for sure what's going to happen. If you go to the mini mart and you buy a Coke and you open the can and then inside of it is something that isn't Coke, you have recourse, right? You have, you have been lied to. There's, there's something, there, there's all sorts of things that help to make sure that when you buy a Coke, you know it's a Coke. But when you start a war, you don't have that sort of certainty about whether or not it's going to go well. When you issue a sanction, you don't know whether it's going to go well. When you issue a tariff, you don't know for sure what's going to happen. In all aspects of international relations, 
There's no way of knowing with the certainty that a Coke purchaser has whether or not what they're buying is actually a Coke. That uncertainty, whether it's something that we think is baked into the human experience or just ref reflective of our ignorance, that uncertainty is what makes international relations as interesting as it is, right? So it's, it's a difficult set of puzzles to think our way through. And one reason for that is because of the humiliating complexity of it all. We have no choice but to apply probabilistic thinking because if you think that you know what's going to happen when you issue any foreign policy intervention of any consequence, that's an act of hubris, right? There is no way of knowing for sure what's going to happen. And it's actually with the word uncertainty fresh in mind that I'd like to conclude with a provocative thought. As best as I can tell, there are two kinds of uncertainty. Uncertainty the first, aleatory uncertainty. Aleatory uncertainty is what happens if you don't quite know for sure what's going to happen, and that's just because of that's how it goes. So a classic example is aspirin and headaches. So suppose that you have a headache, and you're like, that's not very hard for me to believe right now. Shut up. So suppose you have a headache, and you want to know whether or not you should go buy some aspirin. Now, in order to, to, to tap into that difficult question of headache for sure versus aspirin at some cost, and you don't know what's going to happen, you have to think through, what are the possible durations of headaches that I could have? And what is the probability that my that the aspirin will reduce the headache duration? Right? And think about all the different durations of headaches. You could have a zero-minute headache. You could have a 10-hour headache. You could have something in between. There's an infinite number. I mean, you could have all sorts of different headaches, right? Now, do you know for sure how long your headache is going to last if you don't take an aspirin? And perhaps more interestingly, do you know for sure that the headache will be certainly reduced? Do you know for sure what the duration of the headache will be if you take an aspirin? No, you don't. There's no way of knowing that. Why? Well, there's uncertainty that arises for all sorts of reasons. It could well be that you know exactly the placement and the direction of every atom in your body. Let's say that you knew all that, or you had a computer that knew all that, and that was therefore able to apply deterministic thinking to all of the different little things that were happening, right? All of the different little cells. Now I'm going to show you what I don't know about biology. So cells are happening, and cells are making pain receptors happen. Let's just pretend like I know what any of this is. There's some mechanism in place where you take an aspirin, and so suppose that you are able to observe the mechanism perfectly. You can see the atoms. And then you know exactly how long the headache is going to last, right? No. Even if you knew about the atoms, you don't know about when somebody is going to say that they're experiencing pain. You don't get to know that for sure. Some people can absorb a lot of pain without saying that they're experiencing pain, and some people can't. And I'm not sure if you noticed, but whether or not you're feeling gutsy about pain, that varies day by day. And not for, like, atom-type reasons, right? Some of it depends on, like, what kind of mood you're in. Some of it depends on how good of a measuring device you have for time. Measurement error. There's all sorts of little opportunities for randomness, whether it's on the human side or on the measurement side. So even if you did know perfectly so how the mechanism went in terms of aspirins and headaches, which you would be the richest person in the world if you knew that thing that well. Even if you knew that, which you'll never know, but even if you did, there would still be some uncertainty baked into the enterprise of knowing how long an aspirin will endure after you've taken an aspirin. That's what I would call aleatory uncertainty. Uncertainty that even if you got all of the information available of a particular decision problem, there would still be probabilities involved. And that is what you sometimes hear referred to as an irreducible nub of uncertainty. There's some amount of uncertainty that you just can't get rid of no matter how much information you try to gather. Now, given that aleatory uncertainty exists at least for headaches and aspirins and probably also for war and peace, given that, it's great news that we talked about expected utility today because probabilities are baked into the enterprise of international relations and we need to know how to navigate them. But there are other sources of uncertainty too. A second form of uncertainty arises for reasons that we'll be discussing throughout the class, and you might refer to it as strategic uncertainty. And the best way I can tell you about that is unfortunately to talk about baseball. It's fortunate for me, but I have to do some explaining, and I'm not trying to exclude anybody when I talk about baseball. So in baseball, there's a pitcher and there's a hitter. This is the simplest part of it. The pitcher wants to throw a ball past the hitter, and the hitter would like to hit the ball, not let it get past him. So the pitcher wants the batter to fail, and the batter wants the pitcher to fail. That I have a zero-sum game. 
the pitch, the pitcher, most pitchers have a couple of different ways that they can throw the ball. We call those pitches. They can throw it really fast. We call that a fastball. And it doesn't move very much. It's just like a straight ball. And the idea is that it gets past the hitter before the hitter has a chance to react. Or maybe you try to throw the hitter off and you throw a, a straight pitch, but it's slower and the hitter can't time it right. That's called a changeup. And so it's a straight pitch, but it's slower. So a fastball is moving like this and the changeup is moving slower. And so you, th you swing when you think it's going to be a fastball, but it's a changeup, so you're way behind. Or it could be a curveball that goes very slow in the hopes that the sort of like you spin an angle to try to throw the hitter off. Or maybe I take some average of a fastball and a curveball and I wind up with something you call a slider. Or maybe like I decide to just let the gods control all of this and I throw a knuckleball where I'm trying to have no spin on the ball and therefore little randomness in the wind patterns when combined with the, with the strings that are on a baseball. The combination of random winds and baseball strings combined to like make a knuckleball move randomly. So the hitter, even though it's only going like 60 miles an hour, the hitter has no chance of hitting it because it's fluttering. A fluttering baseball. All this to say, a pitcher has many different ways to throw the ball. Most pitchers have two or three or four different options. And they would like to use them in a way where the hitter doesn't quite know what's coming. Because if you were the hitter and you knew for sure that a fastball was coming, you knew for sure you had probability point, you have a probability of one that a fastball was coming, then you would just be able to like, you'd, you'd just sit, you'd sit on it, right? You'd know that you have to swing pretty fast. And as soon as you saw where the ball was going to be, you'd swing there because you know a fastball doesn't move very much. You don't have to worry about curve. You don't have to worry about spin. You don't have to worry about flutter, right? So if you knew a fastball was coming, even if that was their best pitch, you'd be able to set yourself up for success by swinging fast and swinging exactly where you knew the ball was going. If you knew a curveball was coming, you'd swing, you'd wait a second because you know there's going to be some loopiness happening. And you try to figure out where it seems that the ball is headed. You'd, you'd like, your eyes, eyes are amazing, right? So they would like, they'd get a sense about where the trajectory was. They would form some, they would figure out what the path is and they would try to hit the ball as it was going on the path that they inferred. Knuckle ball, you just sort of figure out where it's going and swing real hard. All this to say, the batter would like to know, the hitter would like to know what pitch is coming because if they did, they would have a better chance of hitting it. Because the pitcher and the hitter have competing interests, that means the pitcher doesn't want the, the hitter to know. Consequently, pitchers don't throw the same pitch every time. You probably didn't need me to explain all that with fluttering and paths and curvature, but if you ever watch a baseball game, which I'm looking forward to doing in person sometime soon, if you ever watch a baseball game, the pitcher doesn't throw the same pitch every time. Why? Why doesn't the pitcher throw the same pitch every time? Presumably they have one pitch they think is their best pitch. They should just throw their best pitch every time, right? But then if they threw their best pitch every time, the hitter would know. Which is to say, the zero summiness of a pitcher-hitter interaction, much like a Canada-United States interaction, incentivizes the pitcher to mix things up, to use probabilities in deploying their pitches. So there's aleatory uncertainty, which is the uncertainty baked into the human experience, the fact that we don't get to know headache durations perfectly so. But even if that didn't exist, even if we were able to understand every mechanism perfectly, different strategic settings incentivize probabilities too. They generate the incentive to create probabilities. Different strategic problems create probabilistic things, not because the world is probabilistic, but rather because we are. So no matter how hard you try, no matter how much you learn, you could become the world's leading expert on headache duration. You could become the world's leading expert on which pitch to throw. But that will not get rid of probabilities. There will always be uncertainty. You might get a more precise picture of things. The more that you learn, the more precise your understanding might become. But you will never know for sure. There will always be an irreducible nub, be it aleatory or strategic. So one reason to show you expect utility theory with some agonizing detail isn't just to help us to calculate expect utilities when we talk about games in a couple of weeks. It's because the world is uncertain and I want you to do well in it. And it turns out that expected utility calculations, if you have the time, if, a, if an important decision comes up in your life, and you have the time to think it through, 
You should engage in the enterprise that I showed you today. You should try to specify all of the outcomes a priori. You should say, it could go this way, it could go that way. I could win, I could lose, I could stalemate. I could win 10 bucks, I could lose a thousand. I want you to be clear-eyed and specifying all of the possible outcomes. If you have a chance, sketch out what you think the probabilities are. Sketch out. I think the probability of winning is 0.6. The probability of losing is 0.4. Use history as your guide. Try to get some probabilities that way. Use machine learning algorithms and use their associated classifiers and get the best possible set of probabilities that you can. Ask experts, poll experts, and ask them what they think the probability is. And next thing you know, whether it's because you used fancy statistics, whether it's because you had subjective beliefs about probability, whether it's because you polled experts or whatever, you have a probability. So once you have the probabilities and, and the associated alternatives, once you've been clear-eyed about setting this all up, Calculate the von Neumann and Morgenstern expected utility. Because the axioms that I added, continuity and especially independence, not only are they positively problematic because people don't live up to them when we put them in the lab, they're normatively pleasant. They help you to make good decisions. Maximizing the expected utility function of the von Neumann and Morgenstern form, maximizing that function ends up yielding the best outcome. It is the single best way, if you have the chance, to navigate uncertainty. It is the way if you asked my advice about how to make an important decision, it is the way that I would advise you to proceed, whether that was what bet to make it a poker table, what pitch to throw, which wars to start. They're all the same. Uncertainty is uncertainty, and because of aleatory and strategic reasons, it's always going to be around us. If you are humble about that, then you have some chance of navigating things well. Because everything is poker if you look at it hard enough, just ask Carl von Clausewitz. I say all this because, I mean, I show you a little bit more of this than, than many people would when they taught this class. I show you more about expected utility. I certainly show you more about rationality. And it's not just because I think it's important to show you the assumptions of the theory that we'll be talking about. It's also because I think that this stuff is good for us. I think that digging in these particular sandboxes long enough can help us to improve ourselves and the decisions that we make. I don't want to get too far into that because it's just, just a belief that I have. And I, if I talk about it too much, then, then I'll be adding more to it. But I want to see you make the best choices that you can moving forward. I want to see you, whenever you have a risky decision, not to ignore the risk, but rather to navigate it capably. And the best way to do that, as best as I can tell, is to practice thinking through that decision-making process in analyzing other people's decisions even if they're fake mathematical people. Indeed, one great thing about a fable is it allows us to have a laboratory for what we ought to do in a particular situation. One point of a fable is to help you to know what you should do when you're the protagonist of that same interaction the next time. And so if you look at models as fables, and if you look at rationality as, as normatively some way to proceed, not just a positive theory, but also something of a normative theory. If you look at it that way, then these fables that we're going to be talking about, and indeed the fables we discussed today, are opportunities not just for you to know how countries make their decisions to go to war, but also what you ought to do whenever it's time for you to make a decision that important in your own life. Thanks for watching.